Minister, I promised that I would return to you. Uh, I'm interested, very interested in what Sean had to say. I hope, do you have a microphone? Your mic's up there, we'll get you a microphone. But uh, what Sean, Sean had to say there in relation to bringing in people from other countries, opening up, doubling the size of the population. Given that we have 450,000 people unemployed at present, we have mass emigration, how difficult would it be for you to try and encourage a policy whereby you're saying that the solution to our economic problems is to bring lots of people in while lots of our own are going out? Um, well, I, I, I found um, Sean's personal story uh, absolutely inspiring and uh, listened with, with uh, considerable respect to what he, he had to say, but I was thinking about going back to government and saying I'm after meeting a genius down in the new convention centre and he wants to throw open our borders to China and uh, anticipate what reaction I will get to that. <laughs> uh, it certainly would solve the problem of the ghost estates. Uh, that, that's for sure. Um, but I think, uh, you know, if you look at uh, the United States, uh, they very carefully construct their own visa policy. The uh, United States pitches very deliberately for the best skills that we have here uh, and wherever else they can get them. So I, I, I think the honest answer to your question, Matt, is that would one find that uh, extremely difficult to d drive through? Uh, that's, that's one extreme. But the other extreme is the letter that Sean read from Richard Bruton's department. I mean, uh, I have to say, I didn't understand that it was anything like that restrictive. I understood that a visa application, such as he mentioned, was refused where there was manifest available, uh, availability here of the skills in question. And clearly from what Sean has said, uh, that, so I would be all in favor of rectification of that, but I think the open borders one is going too far. And I think, I, I don't agree with you, Matt, I, I, I don't recall, and, and you can instance them, I'm sure, I don't recall the politicians uh, who came out to oppose the tax incentives to attract certain skills here. I really genuinely don't think there were politicians. There were representatives. Sinn Féin and the opposition are present. There was quite a, well, a I large don't, I vocal. I don't often listen to Sinn Féin, so maybe you're right. <laughs> <laughs> but what I did hear, uh, what I did hear uh, was uh, lots of comment in your profession, and I must certainly don't mean yourself, but in the media, who did precisely that, and who wrote up that kind of position. And, uh, you know, generally speaking, in terms of what we've been talking about, I, I, I think it is very difficult, uh, other than in the uh, specialist uh, press, uh, to get commentary on the subjects that are being discussed here this morning. I, I tend to agree with your own uh, that what is called for is a radical transformation of the education system. The education system served the old economy reasonably well. Not quite as well as we beat ourselves on the breasts about, but I think it, it did reasonably well. But the world has changed. Uh, and, uh, you know, some of my colleagues from the department are here and will be staying with you uh, today, and, and maybe I shouldn't be telling tales out of school, but we found quite a battle with the Department of Education uh, to uh, persuade them to agree to the rollout of industrial strength broadband to every second level school in the country. Um, Why? Well, because they're under phenomenal pressure in trying to... Um, provide for uh, teacher-pupil ratio, teachers, special needs assistance, run the school system as they've always run the school system. Uh, and, you know, this is an extra... Actually, my department is funding not just the capital spend, but we're also funding the current cost uh, for the year after installation and up until the end of the year after installation because education just were not minded uh, to take on board the current running costs. Um, and, you know, to some extent that does betray a mindset because for all of the reasons that the panellists have said, uh, you know, it is absolutely critical that the next generation of uh, uh, young workers 
have the, um, the skills that your own referred to in the case of his own seven-year-old as the facility at home, but not every seven-year-old has the facility to build on that in the school system as currently, uh, as currently organised. Sorry, Minister, given that we're in this desperate situation in the country at present, your own ability in government to deal with the public finances is deeply constrained by the deal that you inherited from the previous government with the Troika. You've got the crisis in the banks, which is almost impossible to deal with. How much can this government do outside of that? How radical can you be in other areas where you still retain influence? Now, how much ambition do you have? And then if you have the ambition, how are you going to get the public servants to implement that, given that we are in a time of crisis and need to do things so dramatically differently? Well, I think Martin is, is, is right. Uh, government continues to function pretty much as government has functioned uh, in the past. And the silo mentality is there. And, you know, we haven't yet reached the stage where we are making investment and other decisions in the areas that matter. Uh, and in the circumstances in which we find ourselves uh, economically, yes, we are constrained. But, for example, uh, you know, I, I have said to my colleagues on the Next Generation Access Task Force um, that where market failure, for example, on the infrastructure question, where market failure is identified and where the state is going to have to put its shoulder to the wheel, uh, that we're going to have to find the investment to do that. But and Minister whether that means pitching for a share of the resources that will come from the disposal of state assets or whether it comes from whatever is left in the piggy bank of the National Pension Reserve Fund or by partnership with the European Investment Bank or whatever it is, that ought to be a priority because but, that is the future. But Minister, is the, the issue necessarily money or is the issue attitude about wanting to innovate, wanting to do things differently instead of doing it in the same way as has always been done? Well, I think it's both. Uh, you know, we, I don't think that we have adjusted the mindset for the digital economy and the challenge of the future, but also there are certain things you can't do without investment. Uh, and, you know, I instance the case of the... Uh, of industrial strength broadband for the schools, but there are other areas as well. Some you might be able to deal with by way of tax incentives or whatever, uh, like the attraction of certain type of personnel uh, here. Uh, for example, I think there's a lot we could do with a small amount of money in respect of the SME sector. Our interaction with the SME sector showed a very poor level of awareness of the potential of using the internet commercially. Uh, now, you know, wh why was that? Well, a lot of them would say that they are so oppressed at the moment trying to keep things afloat and trying to deal with all of the impositions that are on them that uh, talking about, uh, uh, you, you know, increasing the uh, commercial possibilities by using the internet is simply not a priority. And uh, I think we could do a lot to drive awareness in the SME sector without spending a great deal of money. 